Now, like all good things, insert your favorite TV show, movie series, whatever, the Braves' eight-game winning streak is over. But at 14-5 and five, in one win from the best 19-game start in the modern era, this team is undeniably the class we thought they'd be. Welcome into BPTV, Corey McCartney and Grant McCauley with you. And Grant, all those good feelings, and the Braves are clearly feeling it ahead of a showdown with the reigning World Series champion Astros. Yeah, and I think they should be. I mean, this is exactly what you're supposed to do, right? Go out if you're the Atlanta Braves, keep winning series. You're supposed to beat up on the teams that you're supposed to beat up on. And hey, they were able to go win a series in San Diego and came that close to a sweep if they could have found a couple of runs in the finale. So I think all things considered, you have to look at this start and think, this is a great start. This is exactly the way you want to get out of the gates. And they weren't able to do that the last couple of years. So it's kind of a role reversal of what we've seen. But Hopefully this is a Braves club that continues to show that not only can you start well, but you can finish well. They've shown us that the last couple of years. Will they be able to do that? And when they get to the end of that road, might they meet the team that they're going to see this weekend at Truist Park waiting for them in a World Series rematch? I think a lot of people will be intrigued to see that, and this could be a little October preview. Yeah, a lot to get into is the rotations finally at full strength with Max Fried and Kyle Wright, both in the full that matchup with the Astros, which we're going to get into. But first, can we marvel at Sean Murphy? I mean, this guy was hitting 150 with a 593 OPS through the first seven games. The Braves' biggest acquisition this offseason had an OPS of 1308 over the road trip. 318, three homers, three doubles. He's catapulted to 10th in the league in, in fan graph war. 15th and weighted run creative plus Murphy had 11 straight hits go for extra bases. The longest streak in the Atlanta era, one off the franchise record set in 1935. Now the work behind the plate is undeniable. He's already thrown out a couple of runners, but this kind of production at the plate and doing it in this spotlight, obviously, you know, Oakland being what it is and it obviously being at the forefront of everyone's thought process for baseball right now, we know that this is a much more amplified situation for, for Sean Murphy to be in Atlanta. He's firmly, I think, Grant now, in the conversation as the best catcher in the game, and he's showing it without question right now at the plate. Are you telling me the straw that broke the camel's back in Oakland was trading the best catcher in baseball <laughs> to the Atlanta Braves? Is that what I'm hearing? No, we knew Sean Murphy was going to be a great pickup for the Braves, and I know, and, and I'm not one of those I told you so people, but when you and I started talking about this, I said, look inside his splits. The Coliseum has not been kind to him. You look at him away from the Coliseum, you got a guy that slugs almost 500, that on bases, what, close to 350? That is not the case when he was in the Coliseum where he was playing half of his games for his first four years. So I had this feeling that he was going to get into a park like Truist Park and then just keep doing what he was doing on the road anyway and find himself a much better hitter. And I think we've seen that. Now, is he going to have all these extra base hits and stay on this crazy roll and be one of the top most valuable players in all of baseball, well, we'd certainly like to see that. I don't think that's the expectation, but he is showing that there is a level beyond what he'd already shown as a gold glove catcher for the Oakland Athletics and a reason why you'd go out and get him to stabilize your catching situation for the next six years at the very least and have that opportunity to maybe tap into some upside. So a really astute trade, I think, for the Braves, very off the radar for the most part. If you were making that winter shopping list, catcher would not have been at the top of the list, but all of a sudden, the Braves have to be happy with the early returns and feel like they've really got somebody that can help them in a lineup that was trying to find answers behind the top three in the order. Murphy stepped into that cleanup role, and if there's any indication in this first few weeks, he may be able to hold down this role for some time to come. Yeah, we're obviously still not a full month into the season, and you know we know the return of Travis Darno is going to impact his workload, you know, some way, shape, or form. And I, I think, frankly, that only strengthens the notion that no team in baseball has better, a better collective behind the plate than the Braves do with right. Murphy and Darno. But Murphy finds himself on pace right now for 40 homers. That's happened just once in Braves history at catcher with Javi Lopez in 2003. No other Braves catcher has hit more than 25 since 1998. So obviously some very good things happening behind the plate right now. So let's get on to the mound. Max Fried made his return out in San Diego, uh, tossing five scoreless innings with four strikeouts, no walks. We've seen now two turns through the rotation for Kyle Wright, looking much sharper uh, over five and two thirds against the Royals. The past five games, Brave starters have pitched to a 193 ERA, fourth best in the majors, and behind only the Cubs in the National League. That comes with Spencer Strider continuing to collect strikeouts like their Pokemon cards, uh, Charlie Morton putting together a solid start to his season, and Bryce Elder, a 153 ERA through three outings. And things could get a lot more interesting, Grant, with Michael Soroka on his way back and looking fantastic at Triple A Gwinnett. 
Yeah, all Michael Soroka has done is go out and toss six scoreless innings his last time out and lower his ERA to, what, 1.32. So that would seem to indicate that a few things are going right for him. It's just under 14 innings in AAA, 13 strikeouts, four walks for Soroka. I feel like the more that he gets the opportunity to go out there and pitch and get those reps, the more ready he's going to be to help the Braves out at some point, I think, in the not-too-distant future. And that's not to take anything away or get into a debate about where he fits into the plans. I just feel like if he keeps pitching this way, it's foolish not to think that they're going to figure out some kind of plan of something to do with a guy like Soroka. But yeah, getting Max Fried back was huge. He looked great against the Padres, looked very sharp. If it weren't for the hamstring injury, I think he could have easily thrown another inning. He was only at 79 pitches in his return and really handcuffed the Padres hitters through those five innings. I'm with you. I felt Kyle Wright looked very good in his second start after kind of knocking the rust off in the first one. And yeah, you got to be happy with what Spencer Strider's done this year. And what's crazy and scary, if you will, if you're an opposing hitter is, I don't think he's even come close to getting comfortable out on the mound and being exactly where he wants to be. And he's leading the major leagues in strikeouts, at least he was at the end of that start, and is averaging 15 strikeouts per nine at this point. That's also pretty good, or nearly 15 strikeouts per nine. How do you have an encore for what he did last year? Go out and strike out even more batters at an even more insane pace. And that seems to be what Spencer Strider's doing. And I am encouraged about Charlie Morton stepping forward and being able to kind of work his way back into getting comfortable on the mound, getting in a groove again. And maybe by the time we start rolling in through the season, he'll become a little bit less of a question mark in the minds of some. I don't think he's a question mark in the minds of the Braves. I feel like they're just waiting for him and allowing him to just kind of work his way through as a veteran starting pitcher. And then you round it out with Bryce Elder. You know, he had a shot at, at the fifth starter spot in spring training. They went another direction, but they came back to Bryce Elder pretty quick, and he's rewarded them for doing that. So you've got to love the depth. You've got to love the talent. You've got to love the execution of this starting staff right now. And it could get stronger by getting Soroka back in their ranks. This is the depth that the Braves have built, and they've got to be pretty happy with that. Even if some of their plans did not go exactly the way they wanted them to, they've got other options, and they're tapping in to those other options, and those other options are stepping up and doing their job. Yeah, not to to force a conversation here, but obviously they say you can never have enough pitching in that fit, that this, I mean, fits that cliche, but there's also the other cliche of a good problem to have. We know someone is going to end up being the odd man out. So I just want to ask it like this. Who do you feel like is, is I, I guess, maybe under the most pressure while Mike Soroka works his way back? You, Charlie Morton, you know, has looked a lot better. Is it is it just Bryce Elder based on, uh, you know, the resume and the, and the workload to this point? Uh, because I feel like this is just such a fascinating conversation right now to figure out how in the world do you make this work if you've got Max Fried, Spencer Strider, and Kyle Wright all doing what they're capable of. Yeah, I don't think that Charlie Morton's in any kind of danger of losing his spot, particularly if he's not just going out there throwing clunkers and getting chased in the third inning. I mean, if that were happening a handful of times, maybe half a dozen times, maybe you start reassessing what you're doing with really any starting pitcher if it gets into that territory. But you've got Charlie Morton on a $20 million contract, whereas Bryce Holder found himself optioned to Gwinnett in the middle of spring training. I'm not saying he deserved that. I'm not saying that Gwinnett is where he needs to be or should be. I'm just saying that it's just kind of a, a a pretty direct path if you're just looking at who could be or would be the odd man out in this scenario if all of these guys are healthy and pitching as well as they can or at least well enough to keep the Braves in the game every fifth day. Now, I am looking ahead at the schedule to kind of throw another interesting thing out there. When the Braves have this off day on Thursday, then go into the series this weekend against the Houston Astros. That begins a string of 17 consecutive days without a day off with games every single day. Michael Soroka could make at least one, maybe two more starts in Gwinnett over this period of time in the first, what, seven or eight of those games. And by that time, he'd have five starts in AAA, and you'd have a pretty good idea of what he's offering. And then maybe you could utilize him to help lengthen the starting rotation a little bit, reset for a couple of series and find a way to work him in there. I know we're not a big six man staff thing going on here in Atlanta. It always gets talked about when you've got too much of a good thing or a good problem to have, but maybe at that point you just start looking at Soroka as a guy that you can work back in that way and try to figure out the best way to reset your rotation and maybe give a couple of guys an extra day. They are going to get off days at some point right after that. I think they've got three in like a 10 game span afterwards because Major League Baseball scheduling makes so much sense all the time. But you could use him at some point in early May, I guess, to make a long story short. What you do after that, I don't know. It seems to always be, as Brian Snitker said, and I think a lot of different people in the Braves uh, organization have said, these things have a way of working themselves out. Yeah, I think you, what you said there is really key, though. Sometimes it's not about having that six-man rotation. It's about having enough guys that when the schedule doesn't create breaks, that you find a way to get to them when you have that much depth. 
Mm -hmm. uh, after seeing one World Series contender already, I mean, frankly, twice with the Padres, the Braves are going to be tested again by the reigning and defending champion Astros over three games at Truist Park. Bryce Elder gets to start Friday against uh, rookie Hunter Brown, followed by Kyle Wright against Farmer Valdez on Saturday and Christian Javier and Max Fried in Sunday's finale. The Astros haven't been exactly world beaters so far, Grant, in 2023. They're below 500, but it's, I mean, it's just a matter of time with this team before they go on a serious roll. What's your focus on for this series? I mean, maybe this is the time you want to face the Astros when they haven't really got everything going. They don't have Jose Altuve. I mean, they're just not at the peak of their powers. But when it comes to Houston, they've shown us year after year, and I'm not even going to get down the road of some of those years, but they're always there at the end. They're making it to the ALCS. They're pushing an opportunity to get into the World Series and to win the World Series. And as you said, and as Paul Heyman has said many times, the reigning and defending world champions of baseball they're going to get hot at some point. So maybe this is the best time that you could be facing them when they're not really rolling and finding themselves, you know, uh, having the results that they're accustomed to. I think like anything, this series starts with starting pitching. The Braves have got this with Bryce Elder against fellow rookie Hunter Brown. I think that's going to be an interesting matchup. Both of those guys with ERAs under two, some good early success for both of them. I think Brown can rack up some strikeouts. So the Braves and their aggressive approach is an offense. They're going to maybe have their hands full with that one. And then we know a little bit more about Valdez uh, as well as uh, in the game three matchup. We're more familiar with those guys, with Valdez and with Javier. So we'll see how that all plays out. But if you get good starts, it always seems to give the Braves offense the opportunity to either get started early or wake up late and make a mess out of somebody's bullpen. They've done that quite a few times. Yeah, the Braves are hitting a combined 143 versus Valdez, 203 against Javier, but two red-hot former Oakland A's. Uh, they've seen them, obviously, more than anybody, and I think Matt Olson and Sean Murphy are going to be key here. Matt Olson's homered off both of them. Sean Murphy has a double off Valdez. He's homered off Javier. So watch those two cook in this series, and they've been doing that with regularity with both ranking in the top 25 right now among all hitters and way to run creative plus. Don't forget, we've always got you covered here on BPTV. So subscribe, turn on notifications, and tell a friend to help our community grow. Until next time, I'm Corey McCartney. He's Graham McCauley, and we'll see you soon, Braves Country.